system on. Approaching the Zebra Shark Base through the Light Tower. I want to wish you a good morning, and we have a couple of exciting topics for you today. This is Sharks and Coffee with Dr. Jaws. white 
shark nose or white shark nose, but I, I personally like shark nose. But anyway, yeah. So getting back to American shark culture, uh, we usually see bull sharks as aggressive, and I really, I personally do not like that word. I don't like that word at all um, because aggressive, I feel like, implies just this constantly pissed off, you know, like bulldog pit bull thing. You know, it's like. It applies something that's like always in an elevated state of agitation, you know, which is not true um, because there's a thriving ecotourism industry with bull sharks um, presently uh, in the uh, eastern uh, or sorry, western central Pacific, no, eastern Pacific, sorry, like like um, a couple like the Polynesian like islands or Polynesian um, tourist spots, uh, they they'll have these these dives, you know, these wonderful dives with Pacific bull sharks, and people are fine, you know, like I mean they don't bother uh, people on those dives. And then back in the 40s, like in Florida, um, you know, kids were encouraged to ride them because they, they would, this is no joke, they, they would, back in the day, people didn't really know what bull sharks were, you know, and they were just these big, you know, shallow water, you know, slowly cruising kind of animals. And people were kind of encouraged to, uh, well, not encouraged, but they were like, yeah, you could totally jump on it, you know, and ride it. Yeah. <laughs> Shows you how much the world has changed, right? Um, cause like Jaws, you know, Jaws is when people started to really pay attention to sharks. Like the movie, the book, Jaws, mostly, I think mostly the movie really, um, kind of brought it into the American mainstream and, you know, that people started to freak out about sharks and don't get me wrong, you know, like I don't want to paint the bull shark as like a saint or an innocent little guy cause, you know, it is a dangerous animal. Um, I just want to make a discrepancy between aggressiveness and uh, boldness. I like bold, you know, as, as a good word for this shark. Let me have a little sip of coffee. One second. Uh, excuse me. Um, but yeah, so so ever since, you know, Jaws, um, you know, we've, the popular narrative has shifted from this point of like, you know, not knowing what sharks are. Like, uh, the public, um, especially the non-coastal American public, didn't really yeah, they, they don't really know, they didn't know what sharks were, really. Or, I mean, they knew what sharks were, but they just didn't think twice about them. You know, and then now there's this whole very popular narrative. I mean, Shark Week uh, was established in the 80s. Uh, you know, Jaws was here about 40 years now. And uh, we're still in this kind of mindset of, like, you know, like, sharks are misunderstood because everybody thinks they're dangerous. And it's, that's a weird kind of complex mindset um, that I think is a little bit oversimplified. Um, because uh, some species, uh, personally, I think four, four, you know, are, can be fairly called dangerous animals. But, uh, you know, uh, the term shark applies to about 500 species as of 2015. I think the number is 512, to be exact, which is uh, brilliantly diverse. That's, that's a wonderful diversity. But uh, moving on, getting back to bold. Sorry, so I said bold earlier in terms of, like, that's a, a better word for bull sharks. And my thinking there is that most sharks are uh, pretty afraid of people, you know, they, they don't like things as large as them or larger than them, and uh, they'll just kind of veer off, especially of uh, the bull shark's genus, Carcharhinus, you know, there's plenty of times where divers are with Carcharhinus and they just don't, they don't have problems, you know, because the Carcharhinus, you know, are just shy of them, you know, they keep to themselves. But bull sharks are not shy. Um, I don't, you know, based on like, uh, you know, the research, behavioral studies, they just, it, it, the impression I get is that they just don't care, you know, so there'll be times where it, you could be in an area of a bull shark and, you know, nothing will happen, and then there are times you'll be in the area of the bull shark, and as an opportunistic predator, you know, it will go after you, and the attacks are terrifying, you know, and it's, it's, it's part of their natural, um, you know, it's their natural behavior. It's very, very tragic um, because it's a very, uh, I don't know, reading some of the accounts, it's it's very, it's a terrifying experience, you know, and I think there is a validity in that kind of terror, but at the same time, you know, it, it's a very rare phenomenon um, and you have to always remember that and you have to remember that it's, uh, the bull shark is an opportunistic predator. Uh, so it, if on those days where it's in the water and it's near you, you know, it won't think twice, you know, but you know, if you're in the water with it, it doesn't guarantee an attack because it's not, it's not pissed off, you know, it's not aggressive all the time. People sw swum with them before. So swam, 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 moving on. <laughs> 
Uh, let's talk about another experiment, um, kind of highlighting more about this boldness. Um, in Florida, and I believe this was the early 90s, uh, they did this fantastic tank study uh, with bull sharks and uh, other shark species like sand tigers, nurse sharks, I think sandbar sharks, black tip sharks. And they had them all in this big tank and they were just watching them see, see you know, what they do and how they interact. And uh, one thing they found was that there will be times where two sharks will kind of swim towards each other. And, you know, if they kept doing that, you know, they would collide. So, you know, they would have to go away. Like, like one of them has to yield to the other, if that makes any sense. So if, like, you got a black tip and a sandbar swimming towards each other, maybe the black tip will go up or down or away, or maybe the sandbar will go to the side or something. So they just don't hit each other, right? But what's funny, and a pattern that they found, was that with bull sharks, um, they don't yield, or they very rarely yield. And I love that. That's it's it's almost like a personality trait. Uh, if a bull shark is going to head towards a sand tiger, the sand tiger has to yield. The bull shark will plow through. You know, if a bull shark goes, at, you know, is almost going to collide into a sandbar shark, the sandbar shark has to yield. The bull has his direction. He, he's he's done. He's all set. He's just he's just not going to stop. It's incredible. It's it's kind of like it looks like bullying in a way, or it looks like you know like he's the macho honcho. It's it's so funny. I think it's really funny, and of course, it's probably not like that, you know, in in reality, um, you know. And we should do another show on shark personality if if such a thing, you know, can conceptually exist, which I, I think it can in some ways. But moving on. Um, it, that's amazing. I, I, I think that's a fantastic characteristic going in um, tandem with the idea that this is a very, you know, unafraid shark, a very, uh, a bold species, and it just, it just doesn't care. It has its own way. It's his way or the highway. Um, that's fantastic. So uh, it's, it's one of the many reasons why I love this animal. Uh, and then I think our final little point, because uh, I've been talking a lot here about the shark, and I want to keep this little... Uh, show segment thing kind of small uh, or short uh, but the international shark attack file started around the 70s um, maybe the late 60s and uh, before then we've had records of different attacks uh, and especially with bull sharks um, in different places of the world it had a reputation before the shark attack file was established. So there are, you know, it's still an astronomically small event, uh, chance of, of an event, but places like Nicaragua with the Lake Nicaragua bull shark, which used to be known as the Lake Nicaragua shark as a totally separate species, they're not, they're the same. With the Zambezi shark, same thing, it's, it's still a bull shark. Uh, or Australia, um, the... Uh, Oh goodness, what was it called? It was like Cochrane's wheel or uh, no, that's not right. Forget it. Well, anyway, Australia, South Africa, Nicaragua, they had documents of attacks uh, before that, and it, especially like uh, earlier times, like circa 1900 in Nicaragua, and then circa you know, mid 1800s in Australia. Uh, there, it became part of their local lore. You know, uh, it was seen as kind of like a monster in a way. Uh, there were researchers that would go to Nicaragua, uh, from the United States, I believe, and you know they would be told that hey, one of our guys studying the subject to prepare for your arrival, uh, he was eaten. Um, that that's terrifying. <laughs> that's that's very strange, um, and it goes to show that you know remember our current American perception on sharks, you know, it, it, it's, it's a very modern development. Um, there's, there's a lore, there, there's a pre-existing lore about this species in, in different parts of the world. And uh, going along with that, there are just a number of unrecorded attacks. So, excuse me, this coffee's really good. I am drinking, uh, you know, just normal Wawa coffee. Uh, they're the house brand that's like, or house blend, can't pronounce. 30% rainforest uh, certified rainforest alliance, you know, like the little green frog thing. So I'm enjoying it. One second. But I guess my point of that is it's not to kind of feel the fire of fear, but to kind of encourage respect and a broader understanding of the fact that our modern narrative, uh, there's a, there should be an emphasis on modern, is an entire 200 year old, you know, lore with the species 
uh, bull sharks were named in 1841 by Mueller and Anlay. Uh, there's another scientific researcher who has his name on it. It's I cannot speak, I cannot pronounce French correctly. It's like Valencia's, or I, I cannot. V a l i e n n e s, I, I believe, or there's a C in there. And his name is slapped on the bull shark a lot. You'll 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 see that a lot. But I believe Mueller and Anlay from Germany, uh, they were the first to name it. Um, if you, if you go back far enough. So, bull shark, powerful animal, beautiful. There's so much I, I want to talk about it that I just can't in this little uh, segment. So we're gonna move on to heterotrophy and the idea that heterotrophy possibly may relate to or is the root of all evil. Mm. Do you have coffee, by the way? I hope you have coffee. Um, and I hope this has been kind of fun so far. Uh, sharks. Sharks are just, it's its a beautiful, vast world, and we don't know that much. We still don't know that much. Uh, we've, we've named things for about uh, 250 years, right? 17, when, when was Linnaeus? When did he start his stuff? I don't know. We've named things. I mean, scientific, the, the scientific revolution and the scientific narrative that is today, brand new. Still brand new. Comparatively brand new. Still so much more to learn about sharks. You know, it's... It, it, this year alone, I, I, we discovered like 10 species of sharks. 2015, 10 species. It's incredible. Anyway, so heterotrophy. Heterotrophy, as some of you may know, it's something that all animals share and we practice every day. It's the uh, physical constraint that we only survive by eating others, you know, so we eat plants, we eat animals in order to survive, you know, but the, the whole idea of eating, you know, that's not, that's not a universal concept. There are some organisms, plants, uh, algae, uh, which is a type of plant, brown algae, which is not a plant. <laughs> But they make food for themselves. They make food out of sunlight, or um, there are other like bacteria or things that make food out of like rock or chemicals, you know. Uh, but animals don't do that. Animals eat other things. Animals will eat plants. Animals will eat other animals. It's part of our nature. And it's interesting to think that we have to preserve ourselves in that way. You know, if we don't eat other things, you know, we will kind of collapse and die and become disincorporated. Uh, and that applies to the biological sense, you know, in terms of how we survive, but does it apply to a larger economic sense or maybe a political sense or a religious sense? When you think about the phenomenon like colonialism, acculturation, conversion, you know, where other forces, other ideas out there can challenge our own ideas, um, and they, they challenge our existence, they challenge the, the notion that, like, we can't preserve ourselves, you know, while the other group kind of still exists in such a, in such a way, and we, we benefit from consuming the other group. It's a weird concept, I'm being a little vague about it, but bear with me. It's just... Think about the idea that, um, and especially in like my country's history, America's history, think about the idea that we came over here from from uh, Western Europe, and in European colonial interest, claimed a territory that was not ours. It was it was not our sovereignty. We didn't realize that that there were others here before we got over here, uh, but then when we did, we kind of didn't care. And in the name of the crown, and the name of the United States, and the name of, and, and a lot of countries have this dynamic, you know, so I don't want to pick on my own, it's just, since it's my own, it's, it's the one I'm most familiar with. But in our, in the defense of our interests, our own self-interest, and our own way of life, and the, uh, how we are incorporated, we consumed, we consumed land, we consumed culture, in the sense that we told uh, Palatin, or, um, Cherokee or uh, just, uh, tribes, you either stay with us as us, like you have to be Christianized, you have to be, uh, you have to dress in a Western way, you have to speak English, or you have to move. And that's, that's a very odd concept, because in a weird way, that's like a larger form of heterotrophy. 
that is a larger form of to preserve American interests, to preserve colonial interests or interests of the crown, we take resources and cultural identities from other things and incorporate them into our own identity. Or uh, with with certain like Abraham, with Abrahamic religion, for example, the idea that you know you cannot be saved without like Christ and people taking it literally and converging uh, converting you know different native beliefs from both the Americas and Africa, um, or the Spanish Inquisition is a really extreme example. And in order to protect the integrity or the values or the structure of the faith, you know they consumed other faiths, or in a way obliterated. It, it's like this weird competition thing. Or capitalism, it's kind of like the same thing. You know, it, it, it's like you have two competitors, and uh, in order, it, it, like if there's like a niche market, like Blu-ray versus HD and DVD, if you remember that, um, it's the idea that they cannot, you know, coexist. In order for one to succeed, it has to eat the other. You know, uh, Blu-ray has to take HDVD's market, you know, in order to survive. And likewise, HDVD had to do the same thing with Blu-ray. So it's really weird because it's like it's it's an odd pattern. And uh, as it relates to evil, you know, evil being, and I guess our conception of evil is like injustice or um, crime, you know, things like stealing, uh, uh, theft. Um, killing, killing for the selfish gain, uh, killing for reasons of like someone's in your way and you have to remove them in such a way so that you protect your self-interest or stealing in the sense that this is somebody else's property, this is some of what somebody else made and you, you take it for your own selfish interest, you take it from them, you consume their interest to incorporate into your own. It's, it's a heterotrophic structure. It's very fascinating to think about. And how this relates to sharks, I know that that kind of went off on a tangent, and I don't want to take up too much time. But sharks, one of the most powerful appeals of them is the fact that they are the ultimate heterotroph, or the ultimate symbol of heterotrophy. The idea, I mean, because it's like, I mean, my title is Dr. Jaws, because Jaws. You know, Jaws was Jaws because Jaws. Jaws, sharks are known for their razor sharp teeth, you know, perfect tools uh, and perfect hunting machine, uh, perfect tools for finding and locating prey, disincorporating them and reincorporating them into their own structure. They preserve themselves through the probably the most uh, fantastic example of of um, hunting, of of consumption, of of predation. And that's a very, it's part of the appeal, and it, it's, it's just, it's a very big, at least in our culture, it, it's, it's probably the most important thing that sticks out about sharks, is the idea that this is, you know, a threat, this is something that causes harm, this is something that eats something else, this is the apex predator of the world, and the apex predator being probably the most, the, the gravest, or the most apparent example of heterotrophy, of, of the heterotrophic structure. You know, it's, it's not like something that has little spines to defend itself or camouflage to protect itself. This is something that, you know, is a hunter. You know, wolves, tigers, bears, same kind of thing. You know, they're the ultimate heterotrophs, or the ultimate in, uh, idea of, of a heterotroph, in a way. You know, they're beautiful creatures, and they gain their beauty from the consumption of others. You know, if a shark masterfully predates like a tuna, it breaks all the tuna pieces and, you know, digests them and takes all the tuna pieces and reincorporates them into the shark pieces. It's, it's incredible to think about. So, yeah, that took possibly a deeper turn. And if you're listening to this in the morning, it might not be, like, <laughs> the best morning thing. But it's just, it's just food for thought. Uh, <laughs> um, but, yeah, food for thought. Something to think about. And that's the whole point of this program. I do not necessarily believe that this is that heterotrophy is the root of all evil, but I believe that they are tied. And it's a topic that cannot be simply described in the 10 minutes that I gave it. It's, it's something that uh, should be explored more. And we will do that and explore other topics later. But for now, um, I hope you have a great day. And if you like this little segment, and if you like some of the ideas, and you want to hear more, please like this. Please share with your friends. And please comment on what you want to hear about. And feel free, you can criticize my opinions and stuff, that's fine, because I'm not, I'm not the master of the world, I'm just somebody with ideas, so, uh, and I would love to hear any counter-argument, or agreement, or whatever, just be yourselves. So yeah, but, in the name of sharks, and what they represent, you know, thank you for listening, and 
uh, if you like sharks, you have a connection with them, and I, I appreciate you exploring this way to connect. But thanks for watching or listening, and hope you have a great day. And next week, we're going to talk about Muscleless Canis, which is the dusky smoothhound, and accessibility, scientific accessibility. So what does science represent in popular culture? And is there this weird element of exclusion, which I think there is. But anyway, uh, have a great day, and I'll talk to you soon. Adios. System off.